schönen guten Tag, liebe Seherinnen und Hörerinnen des YouTube-Kanals der Zeitschrift International. Hier spricht Fritz Edlinger. Sie hören jetzt nur eine ganz kurze Einleitung zu einem Video, das wir dann im Anschluss an dieses kurze Eingangsvideo ins Netz stellen. Aber einige vorherige Erläuterungen und auch einige Worte dazu. Es handelt sich um ein langes Video, das äh, die Aufnahme darstellt einer Diskussionsrunde eines Roundtables, eines internationalen Roundtables zum Thema, es ist in Englisch im Übrigen, äh, zum Thema Peaceful Solution for, for Ukraine. Äh, es äh, ist das eine Runde von internationalen Expertinnen und Experten, die sich äh, zur aktuellen Ukraine-Russland-Krise äußern, organisiert äh, vom in Wien ansässigen Internationalen Institut für den Frieden, ähm, wo äh, Dr. Hannes Svoboda äh, der Präsident äh, ist und wo unter anderem auch die Generalsekretärin ist äh, ähm, Stefanie Fenkert, die Direktorin. Und unter anderem ist auch unser langjähriges Redaktionsmitglied Professor Heinz Gärtner dort ähm, im Vorstand bzw. leitet dort ähm, einen äh, Kreis von äh, einschlägig tätigen äh, Wissenschaftlern und Forschern. Und er hat gemeinsam mit einem zweiten regelmäßigen Autor von International, Pascal Lothars, das ist dann sich ein Schweizer Politikwissenschaftler, der an einer Universität in Japan arbeitet und lehrt, haben sie diesen Roundtable zusammengestellt und zwar insgesamt fünf Teilnehmerinnen und Teilnehmer. Und ich möchte vor allem zwei davon besonders äh, empfehlen und auch noch einige Worte zu Ihnen sagen, warum es mir auch wichtig ist, dass wir dieses Video ebenfalls verbreiten und ich hoffe, dass der eine oder die andere sich tatsächlich das lange Video äh, ansieht. Es ist nämlich im Moment die internationale und auch die nationale ähm, europäische Diskussion um die äh, Spannungen um den Konflikt in der Ukraine ähm, läuft manchmal in sehr komische Richtungen und in sehr falsche Richtungen, in Richtungen, wo man das Gefühl hat, hier werden in Wirklichkeit äh, ganz andere Ziele verfolgt. Und in dieser Runde sind vor allem zwei US-amerikanische Wissenschaftler, ein Wissenschaftler, ein ehemaliger Diplomat, äh, die dort zu Wort kommen, die völlig anders sprechen als die meisten der ihrer Kolleginnen und Kollegen in Europa. Und es ist interessant, dass es offensichtlich hinsichtlich der Politik der USA und der NATO gegenüber äh, Russland in den Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika mehr Kritiker gibt, Kritiker an der Politik ihrer eigenen Regierung als in Europa, wo man das Gefühl hat, dass man eigentlich nur mehr von US-amerikanischen und NATO-Lobbyisten und Agenten umzingelt ist. Es sind dies vor allem ein Mann, er heißt Jack Matlock, Sie werden ihn dann ähm, ohne das Sehen und Hören chat. Metlock ist ein pensionierter, sehr hochrangiger US-amerikanischer Diplomat. Seine Spitzenfunktion war, er war US-amerikanischer Botschafter in der Sowjetunion in den letzten Jahren der Sowjetunion. Das heißt, er war... Zeuge und Mitbeteiligter der ganzen Gespräche zwischen Gorbatschow und Baker und, äh, und zwischen der US-Regierung und der noch Sowjetunion 
gerade über Themen, die heute eine große Rolle spielen, Schlagwort Osterweiterung der NATO. Er ist einer von jenen, die dabei waren, wo man von Seiten der USA, der Sowjetunion, später Russland in Wirklichkeit bestimmte Versprechungen und Zusagen gemacht hat, die man heute plötzlich nicht mehr wahrhaben möchte. Also der Mann weiß, wovon er spricht. Er ist eine historische Persönlichkeit und er kritisiert sehr genau die Politik und sehr vehement die Kritik der nachfolgenden Regierungen der USA bis heute. Ein ähnlicher Mann ist äh, der zweite, den ich äh, ans Herz legen möchte. Es ist äh, Professor Anatol Lieven, der ein sehr prominenter und erfahrener US-amerikanischer Politikwissenschaft Professor ist, der seit kurzer Zeit in einem neuen, in einer neuen Stiftung in Amerika der Quincy Foundation arbeitet, die sich ebenfalls das Recht herausnimmt, die aktuelle Politik der USA zu kritisieren und zu meinen, die Politik, die jetzt von der beiden Regierung und von der NATO betrieben wird, ist nicht darauf ausgerichtet, eine politische Lösung, einen Kompromiss, wie eben der Titel dieses Gespräches auch bedeutet, Peaceful Solution zu bringen, sondern in Wirklichkeit eine weitere Eskalation. Der langen Rede kurzer Sinn, das ist ein unglaublich interessantes Gespräch. Es ist über eineinhalb Stunden, man kann sich das aber auch teilweise ja ansehen. Es ist wichtig, vor allem auch im Zusammenhang mit dem, was man heutzutage in den österreichischen und in den europäischen Medien und äh, auch von Seiten österreichischer und europäischer Politiker so alles hört. Hier sind Dinge, die wichtig sind und vor allem geäußert, gesprochen von Zeitzeugen, von Leuten, die wissen, worüber sie reden, weil sie dabei waren und die nicht eigentlich nur eine bestimmte Propaganda für eine bestimmte Politik machen wollen. In dem Sinn, herzlichen Dank, dass Sie wieder auf unserem Kanal sind. Sie können, wenn es Ihnen gefallen hat, auch abonnieren und schauen Sie sich die nächsten ein, eineinhalb Stunden an. Es lohnt sich. In dem Sinn, alles Gute, bis zum nächsten Mal. All right, uh, good morning, uh, good midday, good afternoon, good evening to everybody to our today's uh, Zoom webinar discussion on the topic a peaceful solution for Ukraine. Uh, my name is Stephanie Fenkert and I'm the director of the International Institute for Peace and together with uh, Neutrality Studies and its uh, initiator, I would even say Pascal Lottas, I'm going to moderate the discussion today. Um, maybe I just want to give like a very, very short uh, overview before we go and enter the discussion. I would ask everyone, since it's a huge panel, to stick to around seven minutes so that we still have time for discussion. I think it's going to be feasible and I look forward to, to all your insights and your ideas on this topic, which I would say quite uh, unfortunately is, is so high on the agenda these days, not only in the US, but also here in Europe and I'm pretty sure also when it comes more to the East. Uh, all of us, we know that the build-up of troops on the eastern border of Ukraine um, kind of, uh, it's not the first time that this is happening. I mean, we already saw a similar building up of uh, troops uh, last year in, in the beginning, um, in spring, I would say. And uh, now we see like the, the tension is like even bigger, that the red line seems to have been um, somehow moved from not only um, um, challenging NATO uh, enlargement in general, but also when it comes to the troops of NATO uh, station already in the eastern part and NATO members like in Poland and the Baltic states. Uh, we recently saw a lot of talks uh, in Geneva between Russia and the uh, US in Geneva, in Brussels, also in Vienna, where they tried to come to a compromise, how to deal with the situation, how 
come to probably a compromise. And until now, I would say there is not really a lot of success that uh, what we could have been witnessing. Um, taking into account, of course, that the conflict in Russia, uh, in Ukraine and between Ukraine and Russia is a multi-layered one, where also identity plays a big role. We speak a lot about sovereignty, um, about history. We still want to discuss uh, what possible solutions there could be to resolve the crisis peacefully. Uh, in this talk, we want to discuss also what role the European Union could play and if neutrality, for example, based on international law, is an option to ease the tensions and to prevent a violent escalation. Um, Pascal and me will be moderating together and I will already give him the floor for a very, very short introduction. And I ask all the people and all the participants, please submit questions in the Q&A uh, section. We will go through it during the talks and I now already hand over to Pascal. Uh, to introduce um, the first speakers and let me thank you again for the cooperation. I really look forward that many of you, that all of you actually made it today to discuss these very, very important issues. Pascal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and welcome everybody also from my side. I am Pascal Lota. I'm an assistant professor at the Vasada Institute for Advanced Study here in beautiful Tokyo, and um, I got an email about a month ago from Klaus Lares, who published a wonderful essay by Ambassador Jack Matlock, uh, who wrote very critically about the, um, about the problems that Ukraine is facing today. And taking this as a starting point, I reached out to Ambassador Matlock, uh, who immediately agreed to give a talk and also recommended uh, Nikolai Petro and Anatoly Levin to take place and the IIP in Vienna agreed to uh, host the, uh, this event and then also add uh, our colleagues uh, Olga Oliker and Luisa Biala, Biala -Sie 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 <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very sorry Luisa, you will correct this immediately and Heinz Gertner of course also from the, um, from the IIP um, in, in Vienna and we want to discuss so what kind of solutions there could be for for Ukraine. So welcome to everybody. Let me just very briefly introduce the first three speaker. Ambassador Jack Matlock is a career diplomat who served on the front lines of American diplomacy during the Cold War. Uh, he was the director of Soviet affairs at the State Department and later ambassador to Czechoslovakia and from 1987 to 1991 he was the US ambassador to the Soviet Union witnessing the very end of that state uh, in Europe and since retiring from the foreign service he has focused on understanding how the Cold War ended and how the lessons from that experience might be applied to a public policy today so he has also gained a reputation as a historian Toward the end of um, last year, he, he wrote that um, essay, that essay, which then started quite a controversy of um, people critical of these opinions, but also a lot of support, um, also coming from uh, uh, Anatol Levin and Nikolai Petro, which brings me to the second speaker. Uh, Anatol Levin is a British author, um, a policy analyst and professor at Georgetown University, and currently a visiting professor at um, at King's, uh, King's College, London. Uh, actually, sorry, I have to cut in. I'm, I'm no longer at George Time. I, I'm at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft in Washington. I am very sorry. <laughs> that, ha that has reached me only now. So at the Quincy Institute, uh, he is, and he recently published a book actually on Ukraine and Russia, uh, fr a fraternal rivalry, and wrote an essay in, in defense and... Um, in defense of Ambassador Matlock's assessment and on the situation in Ukraine. He, is, he has also recently published an article in which he argued for Ukrainian neutrality. Then the third speaker is going to be Nikolai N. Petro. Uh, he is professor of politics at the University of Rhode Island, where he teaches comparative and international uh, politics. His focus is on the role that religious, historical and cultural narratives play in democratic development and his regional areas of expertise are Russia and Ukraine. Uh, he's the author of many books, among others, The Rebirth of Russian Democracy and Russian Foreign Policy. 
And with that said, um, I'll let the other three speakers be introduced by Stephanie. Stephanie, please. You're muted. Thank you very much, Pascal. I'm very happy to, to welcome also um, Olga Oliker. She's program director of the International Crisis Group, um, um, responsible for Europe and Central Asia. She, she zoomed in from Brussels, so welcome. I would like to introduce, uh, of course, also Luis, uh, Luis uh, Bialashevic. It's a difficult name. I try. I hope I, I did it right. She's a political geographer and professor of European governance at the University of Amsterdam. And she's also a member of the advisory board of the IRP. And last but not least, of course, I would like to introduce um, Heinz Gärtner. He's professor of political sciences and uh, he's also um, he's the chair of the advisory board of the IRP. And I look forward to your inputs after the first three speakers. And thank you very much. With that, I would like to give the word to Ambassador Jack Matlock. Um, Ambassador, you have about seven, eight minutes. Um, please let us know your viewpoint on how to restore peace uh, in Ukraine. Well, first of all, I think we need a better understanding of the historical background of some of these. And to say briefly, I believe that uh, since the end of the Cold War, which I believe ended uh, ideologically and definitively by 1989, that um, the policies of the, uh, of the, uh, the United States and its allies uh, in Europe uh, have failed to take advantage of the uh, of the end of the Cold War when we produced a Europe whole and free. Since then, I think beginning in the late 90s, uh, Western policies have tended to redivide Europe. And I think that is unfortunate. Now, the second point I would make is that there is a widespread belief both in the West and in Russia that the Cold War ended with a defeat for the Soviet Union. I consider that absolutely incorrect. The Cold War ended by negotiation to the benefit of the Soviet Union and of the United States and its Western allies. Everybody won. Uh, and uh, the second misperception is that uh, the Cold War ended with the breakup of the Soviet Union. That too, I think, is incorrect. Uh, the Cold War had ended before the breakup of the Soviet Union, and the breakup of the Soviet Union was not a product of Western policy uh, in the Cold War, but rather of internal uh, politics within the Soviet Union. I would say the main uh, person who led the breakup of the Soviet Union was the elected reader a leader of the, of the RSFSR, the Russian Soviet Federated Republic. Uh, and it started with essentially a conspiracy. Now, uh, so people have in their idea that, well, we won the Cold War. Uh, then they would say Russia was defeated, <laughs> although it was the Soviet Union that wasn't Russia. Uh, and uh, the third, uh, therefore, as uh, Francis Fukuyama famously wrote, it was the end of history. It was proof that uh, this sort of, of political system, which we call democracy uh, in the United States, Western Europe, and maybe a handful of others, uh, was the future of mankind. And there also was the idea that somehow uh, you can uh, use, uh, you had the power uh, to um, uh, change other countries. So there was also a total misperception of power. Of course, during the Cold War, we spoke of the two superpowers uh, because uh, two countries, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union, had enough nuclear weapons that if they were used, could not only wipe out the enemy, they would wipe out everybody. Therefore, their use, of course, was totally, not only unacceptable, totally ridiculous. 
Uh, well, you know, as far as nuclear weapons, they're still two superpowers. But in speaking of terms like superpower, you ignore what power of what sort can do and cannot do. Now, uh, military power cannot spread democracy or any other uh, system of government. Military power cannot uh, protect human rights, however we define them. And by the way, our definition keeps changing uh, from one type or another. Now, uh, in that context, I think it has been a tragedy that beginning in the late 90s, uh, and one of the acts was the attack on Serbia without a declaration of war or uh, agreement in the Security Council. I know there are humanitarian issues, but that was an illegal war. Uh, and uh, of course, that plus uh, the beginnings of expanding NATO, when other countries, uh, the countries in Eastern Europe were not under any threat, um, uh, something I argued strongly against. Uh, then this began a process which inevitably would have brought about a redivision of Europe. Now, what does this all have to do uh, with the Ukraine? I would say we have to recognize that Ukraine, uh, uh, though uh, in effect was handed independence uh, uh, in uh, 1991, uh, by, uh, by the pressures of, uh, 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 led by uh, Boris Yeltsin, the Russian president. Uh, its borders have been put together relatively recently, and the most important uh, architect of its borders was Joseph Stalin. Uh, unfortunately, it has not been able to develop uh, a, a concerted, you might say, um, feeling of what it means to be Ukrainian. Uh, and uh, those in the West who were most recently joined to the Soviet Union by Stalin uh, uh, have one definition of Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian nationality. Others in the East, you have many who are Russian speaking, uh, but consider themselves Ukrainians, uh, but uh, would like to keep their the Russian identity. Now, so I think Ukraine's problems, and when you look at the uh, when you look at the elections that have taken place, it has been clear that Ukraine's current constitution does not accommodate the fact that the country has not yet developed a unified uh, definition of what it means to be Ukrainian, and. Uh, uh, Therefore, uh, each of the elections were, were won by a very narrow uh, majority, uh, but uh, with uh, the uh, West uh, voting over 90% uh, for uh, 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 one side and the East up to 85, 90% from the other side. Uh, so uh, that has been uh, the problem, uh, uh, the fundamental problem. Now, uh, I, I'll leave it to others to uh, look at some of the uh, results of this, but I would say that uh, the policies of the West, uh, based upon those misperceptions, which I've already mentioned, uh, that the Cold War ended with the defeat of the Soviet Union, that the breakup of the Soviet Union was a victory for the West, uh, uh, and that somehow uh, this left the United States and its allies with the power uh, to uh, spread uh, uh, its, what we call democracy, um, uh, to other countries using by whatever means necessary. There was also combined with this, the idea that uh, 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 Russia uh, 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 should be sort of reduced in power, 
I think as Vignit Brzezinski always looked at things in great power terms, uh, as if we had learned nothing from two world wars in the 20th century, uh, that uh, somehow, uh, but what became an internal problem in uh, Ukraine, and one which I think will only be served, uh, solved uh, if the Ukrainians are willing to uh, adopt a federal system uh, which gives um, equal rights to other language groups, uh, just as, say, uh, in Finland, the Swedes, uh, who are a minority, have full cultural rights. Uh, and one would wonder what would happen to Irish independence if they insisted you couldn't be a loyal Irishman unless you spoke Gaelic. Uh, I mean, um, the, so the idea uh, uh, that somehow uh, the Russian language has no place in Ukraine is simply a self-defeating assumption that some make. Uh, now, so that, where does that leave us? Uh, I think that actually the uh, involvement of the West um, in uh, this uh, divided nation, which nevertheless is geopolitically absolutely essential to Russia, not for Russia to uh, dominate and rule, but at least to have as uh, a non-enemy and hopefully a friend. I mean, just look at the map or look at the uh, history. Uh, so uh, my own feeling is that uh, the militarization, first of all, of uh, a new division in Europe has been a big mistake. I think it is unnecessary. Uh, there's no reason for a new Cold War. Uh, there was a reason uh, when the Soviet Union was a, at a communist state dedicated to world revolution, as it was early on, but uh, dropped by Gorbachev. So um, the, the idea of replicating and talking about a new Cold War makes it almost very difficult for us to deal with the real problems today, which are, well, we know epidemics, uh, uh, environmental degradation, uh, uh, terrorism, uh, the mass displacement of peoples, uh, these uh, uh, failed states, these are, are problems that are not going to be solved by competing over who controls what territory. Uh, so I would say that uh, uh, now, uh, when we get into to the precise uh, present, I would say, first of all, the Ukrainians have to get their act together in a less than uh, uh, suicidal uh, course. Uh, in terms of the, their most powerful neighbor, uh, and that uh, the, the, uh, in many ways, the less the U.S. and the West interfere, particularly by encouraging uh, militarization, um, uh, the easier it's going to be uh, for them to come uh, to that uh, uh, to that uh, conclusion. And just finally, on my part. We need to find a way to walk back from this idea uh, that uh, there is a struggle between East and West or a struggle between, uh, uh, now the division is Ming, uh, between authoritarianism and so-called democracy. I'll tell you, every one of our countries has elements of authoritarianism. There might be degrees of it. There is there's no inconsistency between democracy and an authoritarian government if the people of a country feel threatened in one way or another. That's what produces authoritarianism. So the idea that this is the sort of ideological struggle we had during the Cold War is wrong. And uh, I think basically we're going to have to come off these mistaken assumptions and begin to deal with the reality if we are to meet the, uh, the challenges of the real issues that should unite us rather than dividing us. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for these very powerful words of yours. Then I would like to give the word to, um, to Professor Anatolifen. 
uh, to please give us your view on the matter and on, on Ukraine, please. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it goes without saying, I, I endorse everything that Ambassador Matlock has just said. Um, just a few thoughts to, to, to add to it. Um, one is that uh, I, I think that we in Europe, I'm British, but I suppose I can still consider myself an honorary European, uh, make one uh, fundamental conceptual mistake about Russia, I think, which is that since Russia is situated on the same continent as the European Union, uh, we expect um, Russia to play by the internal rules of the European Union without, of course, being a member of the European Union uh, or NATO. Um, from Russia's point of view, of course, uh, it has a complete right, as it sees it, to operate uh, on along the lines followed by other great powers in the world, um, led most notably by the United States. And of course, from the point of view of um, policy towards Ukraine, uh, a point that many of us have made <laughs> over and over again, uh, the United States, um, for very nearly 200 years, has made uh, th you know, the, the, the single most important and most continuous aspect of its external policy, the stated determination to exclude actual or potentially hostile military alliances led by actual or potentially hostile great powers from its immediate neighborhood in Central America and the Caribbean, the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and as we have seen within our own lifetimes, or at least certainly mine, I'm getting a bit old, of course, the United States has been willing to, to act with extreme ruthlessness in Central America uh, in defense of the, the Monroe Doctrine. So. Um, there is a, a, a problem here in mutual perceptions between Russia and Europe. Uh, in the case of America, I have to say, um, the attitude can more simply be summed up under the heading of hypocrisy. Uh, now, concerning the specific issue of neutrality, um, a, a couple of points. Uh, the first is, of course, as with the Austrian State Treaty, uh, as indeed uh, with the, um, the, the Finnish uh, treaty. Um, the whole point about a treaty of neutrality is that it cuts both ways. In other words, it excludes um, Ukrainian membership of NATO. The European Union, I think, is an issue that one can uh, defer, shall we say. Um, but it also excludes a close uh, alliance with Russia of the kind which, at least until 2014, was aimed at by the Russian government, you know, membership of the Eurasian Union, that would also be excluded. And that I think is um, both the only, you know, the, de facto, the only way to um, uh, an agreement over Ukraine, but it is also a recognition of a uh, simple basic reality, uh, as emphasized by what happened in 2014 and since, which is that trying to force Ukraine into a clear choice between Russia and the West, uh, or um, Russia and America, uh, it, it is, is disastrous. Um, it is bound bitterly to divide Ukraine. Uh, and as we've seen, um, it will produce on one side or another rebellion uh, against uh, any such attempt. Um, in 2013 to 2014, we saw rebellion against the attempt to take Russia, in, uh, to take Ukraine into the Eurasian Union. Uh, but then, of course, when Ukraine lurched uh, heavily towards the West, we saw, and towards um, Ukrainian ethnic nationalism, uh, we saw revolt against this in eastern parts of the country. So neutrality uh, corresponds both to, the, to international realities, but also to realities within Ukraine. I'm sure that Nikolai will have a lot more to say on this subject as one of the greatest experts on uh, ethnic relations and identities within Ukraine. Uh, although, eth well, I won't get, get into the difficulties of defining who is, uh, you know, who is and who is not an ethnic Ukrainian or Russian in the east and south of the country, an extremely complicated issue. Um, now, the second point I think to make is that, um, paradoxically enough, uh, 
as things stand, uh, the debate about um, NATO membership for Ukraine is also, of course, completely empty uh, because Ukraine cannot get NATO membership. Uh, a, as long as the issues of Crimea and the Donbass remain unsettled. Uh, but secondly, uh, of course, because uh, NATO and the United States have made repeatedly clear that they will not fight to defend Ukraine. In other words, um, any uh, offer of Article 5 guarantee to Ukraine uh, would be totally empty, utterly false. And something that I think, you know, I at least have pointed out repeatedly to people in NATO, uh, far from in any way strengthening NATO, would actually severely, perhaps catastrophically undermine uh, the, the image, the credibility of the Article 5 guarantee more generally for, for the existing members of NATO. Um, but, uh, of course, by the same token, as long as, from Russia's point of view, the threat of NATO membership uh, remains, um, that is certainly a, a strong incentive to keep uh, the issue of the Donbass open. Now, on that, however, uh, there is um, a second way of approaching the issue of Ukrainian neutrality, if it is simply whether you stay for reasons of principle, whether you say for reasons of prestige, or whether you say because of the moral cowardice of our leaderships. If it is, in fact, impossible um, formally to abandon the principle of keeping the idea of NATO membership for Georgia and Ukraine open, um, there is a way to that, uh, to, to neutrality, uh, as you might say, by the back door. Uh, and that is the Minsk II agreement uh, on autonomy, full autonomy, guaranteed under international treaty uh, for the Donbass within Ukraine. Uh, because certainly as the Ukrainian government and parliament majority have feared, um, which is one key reason why they have uh, refused to, to implement Minsk II, um, autonomy for the Donbass within Ukraine would, uh, in effect, act to block unilateral Ukrainian moves towards the West. It would be, it would act as an insurance policy for uh, all those um, elements in Ukraine, uh, which as Ambassador Matlock have said, has said, have been historically extremely strong. Uh, very difficult today to say how strong, because just as, you know, opinion polls in the Donbass uh, cannot, of course, be taken at face value. So, you know, in um, the rest of Ukraine, uh, you know, we have seen a degree of um, state control, um, which also makes it very hard to assess what public opinion on these issues really is. Uh, but certainly, um, uh, a peace settlement for the Donbass uh, would, uh, in my view, also address the basic issues um, that we are talking about. Um, and of course, as long as the conflict in the Donbass remains open, uh, there will be a permanent risk, uh, even if we can get, get through the present crisis uh, without a new war, there will be a, a permanent risk of a new war erupting. So Europe will, will live under this sort of Damocles, not of, going, not of the West going to war with Russia unless through some truly catastrophic succession of idiotic mistakes, uh, but certainly um, a war with very damaging consequences for our continent. Um, now, finally, uh, when it comes to uh, Ukrainian uh, democracy or democratization and moves towards a successful free market, something that we really have not seen in Ukraine so far. You know, it, it is worth pointing out that um, Ukrainian GDP per capita is still only a third of Russia's. And this after seven years of reforms that have been so trumpeted by the West and of course fairly heavily supported as well. Um, now, the line that we have heard really since the beginning of NATO expansion, um, and EU as well, of course, is that it is only through membership of NATO and the European Union uh, that successful democracy and economic reform can be guaranteed. 
Uh, I have to say, say that I see this very differently. Um, Finland and Austria, of course, uh, achieved tremendous success as free market liberal democracies without being members of either NATO or the European Union. Um, you know, the, and, and have not developed in any way further from that point of view since the end of the Cold War. Uh, on the other hand, of course, we have seen a number of melancholy cases by now in Eastern Europe among the former communist states where membership of NATO and the European Union has certainly not guaranteed successful democratic or at least liberal democratic reform uh, or, of course, moves towards government honesty and real you know, successful uh, anti-corruption measures. Uh, my view is that if a country is not capable of developing successfully as a free market democracy uh, without being in NATO and the European Union, then it almost certainly is not going to develop successfully uh, if it's in the EU and NATO. Um, Turkey is not, of course, in the European Union, but it is in NATO, um, not perhaps one's ideal of a liberal democracy today. Uh, so I think that this is a, a, false, um, a false argument. Uh, moreover, um, as long as the conflict with Russia remains, um, once again, I'm sure that Nikolai will have something to say about this, uh, this will more or less ensure uh, that um, forces in Kiev uh, develop Ukraine or, or are dedicated to developing Ukraine and have success in this from an official point of view uh, as a mono-ethnic, ethno-linguistic state. Um, that, of course, guarantees permanent trouble you know, with the Russian and the Russian-speaking minorities. So, uh, and also, of course, will act or certainly should act as a tremendous barrier to Ukraine's progress you know, towards Western liberal democracy. Uh, of course, how long our own liberal democracies will last is another question, but it is another question, so I won't get into that. One last point, since I suppose spiritually we're all in um, Vienna today, wherever we may physically be around the world. Um, I was brought up, I'm not that old, but nevertheless, uh, as many of us perhaps with a historical sense, particularly if we have an East European or Central European background, very much in the shadow of what happened in 1914 uh, and how the gr European great powers and great civilized powers uh, destroyed each other and came damn close to destroying European civilization, starting in 1914. And then, of course, the consequences of that later. Um, it's... Uh, it's worth remembering that every one of those states went to war uh, in the sincere conviction uh, that it was fighting for you know, a version of superior civilization. Uh, we really don't see it that way 110 years on. Um, and uh, as Ambassador Matlock has said, you know, given uh, all the other threats hanging over us, including climate change, I really do not think that it is how our descendants will see us uh 110 years from now um if we uh if we do continue along our present path uh, of confrontation and perhaps conflict with russia um there was a british poem which went and it went through all the countries of europe germany austria russia france britain and it's um a succession of ghosts of soldiers killed and at the end of every verse there is the line i died for freedom this i know for those who bade me fight have told me so thank you thank you very much for those poetic words and uh, let me just say that as um this being organized in austria and me being swiss and also having a memory of uh, uh, this kind of historical memory and knowing that in 1815 Switzerland too was neutralized and for the Austrians then too in 1955 there seems to there just seem to be a lot of parallels right that are so obvious and striking that we thought that a lot of us here think that it might just be a solution to say this is not going to be anyone's land as you pointed out but on this note we would like to know from uh, Nikolai Petro what how he sees the situation if you see um, if you would see as a neutral solution uh, as a solution, or if you have an other, um, another way that you would like us to look at the whole situation. Nikolai, please. 
Thank you very much. Um, I will be echoing some of the points already made, but add a few of my own, and I will be brief. From my perspective, there is, in addition to the conflict between Russia and the West over Ukraine, and the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, a conflict within Ukraine, which is primarily about who gets to define Ukrainian identity. For many in Western Ukraine, inspired by the historical example of Galicia, being Ukrainian means rejecting all things Russian, language, religion, trade, resources, science, music, books, everything. Only when Ukraine has thus decolonized itself will the true Ukraine be able to emerge. During the 2014 Maidan, this was referred to as making a civilizational choice. For many in Eastern or Malaros Ukraine, however, being Ukrainian means having a distinctive regional identity that still shares much with Russia. Most people in this Russophile half of Ukraine rejected the call for a civilizational choice as unnecessary, divisive, and demeaning. This conflict can be traced back at least 150 years. Some would say longer. During that period, it has led to armed conflict within Ukraine three times, during World War I, during World War II, and after the 2014 Maidan. Since 1991, however, it has also led to sporadic violence over the course of the last three decades in Donbass, Crimea, uh, Galicia and Transcarpathia. The obvious solution is federalism. Many Ukrainian politicians understand this. Federalism was proposed during the latter half of the 19th century by the founding fathers of the Ukrainian national movement. Then again, when Ukrainian statehood was first declared in 1917. Then again, in the early 1990s, by the leader of the Ruch movement, Vyacheslav Chernovil. But it was always a pro opposed by militant Galician nationalists who feared that the East would then secede and leave them with a much smaller nation. In today's Ukraine, advocating federalism is tantamount to treason. But the problem of what to do with Russophile Ukraine in a nationalistic Ukrainian state remains. It became acute again in 2014 when many in the East saw in the Maidan an, an effort by Galician Ukraine to exclude them from the country's political life entirely. I conclude, therefore, that the crisis inside Ukraine cannot be solved by external intervention, but only by a process of dialogue healing and reconciliation that must begin by acknowledging that the vast majority of Ukrainians are bicultural and that rejects efforts to create a Ukrainian nation without its Russophile citizens. The second Minsk Accord start from this premise and seek in fact to enshrine the principle of cultural autonomy in the Ukrainian constitution. That is why they have such wide support in Donbass and so little support in Western Ukraine. Kiev, as former foreign minister Pavlo Klimkin now acknowledges, never intended to fulfill these agreements because they were seen as a backdoor to federalism. Instead of Minsk's amnesty and constitutional provisions for local autonomy, therefore, the Ukrainian parliament has in recent years passed laws on reintegration, which stipulate that after the liberation of Donbass, its population will have to endure limited civil rights for the next 20 to 25 years. This has evoked little comment in the West, but I fear that it will create future generations in Donbass resentful at constantly being reminded that they are not considered true Ukrainians. Foreign policy neutrality cannot solve this problem. At best, it can lessen the global tensions that are being provoked by efforts to make Ukraine part 
of this or that sphere of influence. This is no small thing, to be sure, but it does not even begin to address the problem of intolerance, which the murdered journalist and writer Alice Bouzina described so graphically in 2010. Quote, our debates, he meant within Ukraine, are not between the government and Her Majesty's opposition, not between two schools of respected science, but between two different countries, as if a contemporary evolutionary biologist could have a discussion with an inquisitor from the Middle Ages. At best, they will simply choose to ignore each other. At worst, one of them will smash the other's skull without, by the way, having proved anything to his opponent. The conflict over Ukraine, in other words, is distinct from the conflict within Ukraine. Resolving the conflict over Ukraine will not resolve the conflict within, whereas resolving the conflict within will resolve the conflict over Ukraine. That sort of healing can begin when the Ukrainian government stops denying that there is any domestic aspect to this conflict and embraces dialogue with its Russophile citizens, perhaps in the form of a truth and reconciliation commission that would allow former enemies to become true stakeholders in a new and more inclusive Ukrainian society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikolai, for, yeah, for your words. Uh, I'll pass the uh, moderation now to Stephanie. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to continue with Olga, uh, and I think uh, you already heard uh, a lot of things uh, on which you would like to comment. But I would also like to draw the attention still on on the situation right now, because I mean the situation is dangerous. I mean at least it is portrayed as quite dangerous. There is a hundred thousand troops, and it's not only on the on the eastern flank; it's also in the north and also in the south from uh, on Crimea, which has been and 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 I think we all can agree upon that. Uh, annexed illegally by by Russia in 2014, and I think this is also even though we talk about what is going on within Ukraine, the, the events in 2014, of course, also shape the course of Ukrainians also within the country. And I think this is also quite logical if you look at, for example, of how the support towards NATO enlargement was before 2014 and how it changed afterwards. And I think there has been quite a shift. So uh, I, I do not want to take any much time from, from uh, your intervention, but please feel free on how do you assess the situation right now? How big is the danger? Uh, can is there possible to find a, a solution between and in this context? I mean, again, then USA and Russia, considering that the demands of Russia from the beginning have been, uh, I would say, quite strong and even been considered as non-starters from the Western point of view. But please, Olga, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Pascal, and thank you for the International Institute of Peace for convening this conversation and for inviting me to take part in it. Um, so. You know, just to echo Stephanie's introduction, I think as I go, I will respond to some of the things other panelists have said, but, you know, it is useful to point out that Ukraine is at war. Uh, a war continues on its territory. And that what we've seen over the last year is a series of events that have put lie to assumptions, I think a lot of us made previously that despite the war, Everybody was, if not happy, then willing to live with the new status quo of a continuing war. Russia, because it kept Ukraine off balance. Ukraine, because it kept the West on its side. But what we've learned over the past year is that Russia wasn't so happy, right? So we saw a troop buildup in the spring of last year, which was partially um, reversed. They kept the infrastructure and some of the forces back. And then another troop buildup that began this fall and continues to this day. Now, I think it's worth pointing out that Russia hasn't made any new threats to Ukraine, except those exemplified by putting a whole lot of forces near um, Ukrainian territory. And that Russia's buildup has led to talks with Western states, which aren't simply about Ukraine, they're about European security in general, because Ukraine, although it certainly matters as Ukraine, matters far more to both Russia and Western states because of its implications for European security. Um, and Russia, as uh, Stephanie just noted, Russia put forward these two draft treaties, uh, one for the United States, one for NATO, which demanded legally binding commitments that NATO would not enlarge, among other places, to Ukraine, that NATO forces would pull back from the territories of states that um, 
had not been allies prior to the first wave of expansion, which is to say to basically where they were before 1997, uh, that no uh, shorter intermediate range missiles be deployed in Europe. That one's a little more reasonable. Um, but yeah, I mean, a series of kind of demands, uh, which got everyone talking, right? So it's not a terrible thing if you make uh, fairly expansive demands if they get everyone talking, but then the talks didn't seem to go that well. Um, now, what's interesting in the talks is that the counter proposals that came back from the United States and NATO were focused on conventional arms control. We're focused on an assumption that you have an international situation where you've got a standoff. It's going to be a standoff for a while. You need to manage it to put in things in place that will manage the escalation, right? We're not looking to solve. We're looking to manage. Um, and, you know, I think there are actually some fairly reasonable ideas. Um, but... What we've got right now is coming out of these meetings is a sense that the Russians want to talk to the Americans because that's where they think the decisions are made and the deals can be delivered. They're not entirely wrong on that. They're not entirely right on that in that the Americans do need allies and friends in order to move forward anything. And Moscow says it's waiting for written responses from the United States and don't particularly want to talk to NATO. So let me talk you through, and this actually is also partially response to one of the questions that was asked by Elena Yermakova on, you know, is, is, a, is an invasion possible? Is further escalation possible? So here's my story on why it is quite plausible that Russia may escalate in Ukraine. And that is because it has a lot of reasons to and not a lot of reasons not to. It wants deals on Ukraine, I mean, uh, it wants a Ukraine that is its vassal, really, and it wants deals on European security. These are intertwined, but they are also separate. It has laid out what kind of a deal it wants on European security. And while what it got back struck me as very reasonable proposals, those aren't what Moscow wanted. Now, Russia may very well be thinking that a bit or a lot of military escalation could get everyone to come to their senses. Uh, make them realize that Western states won't come in to save Ukraine and that everybody needs to cut a deal on Russia's terms or closer to them. Um, it may also be thinking that Western deterrence threats, uh, those of more military buildups, more sanctions, those are all things that are happening anyway from Russia's perspective. So it doesn't matter what they do. If you're going to get more sanctions and more of a buildup in the East, no matter what you do, okay, you're threatening me with things that are already happening. Okay, that, that's not really all that scary. Um, and I think the inherent threat that escalation in Ukraine will hurt because of the Ukrainians pushing back, I think Moscow's uh, planners largely discount because I, in my view, they underestimate Ukrainian military capacity and they certainly underestimate Ukrainian will. Um, so pushing back a little bit at something Nikolai said, look, the Russians do assume that the Russophonic population is Russophilic. This is not actually the same thing. You can speak Russian and not be pro-Russian. I speak Russian. I'm not pro-Russian. It's my first language. That doesn't make me pro-Russian. Um, and I think this is one of the challenges. Also, I point out that nobody has done as much for Ukrainian nationalism, possibly in the last 100 years, as Vladimir Putin has. Right. I mean, to unify Ukrainians uh, as Ukrainians for all the things that continue to divide them, for all the disagreements about what it means to be Ukrainian and American. There are lots of disagreements on what it means to be American, too. But nothing has made them feel as much like all that aside, we are Ukrainian as this war. And public opinion polls do support that. And I disagree with Anatol. I do think you can carry out academically solid public opinion polling in government controlled Ukraine. A lot of my friends do it. Um, so what are our options to prevent war if we are the West, which you know is the only position I can speak from? I mean, I will also note we've got a panel here of people talking about Ukraine. As far as I know, none of us are Ukrainian. I mean, my grandmother's from Zhitlomir, but um, you know, she left Zhitlomir for Petersburg uh, in the 1920s. Um, so, you know, I don't claim to be Ukrainian. So what can we do? Um, so one option, threaten escalation to frighten the Russians. But as Anatolia said, NATO member states won't fight. They've made that very clear. Um, and the continuing threat that there's going to be more buildups is something Russia expects anyway. Give Russia what it wants. 
But the fear in NATO and among many of its members um, and among neighbors uh, between NATO and Europe is that this is going to undermine their own security. And certainly um, agreeing to the promises of military rollback that Russia wants will make these countries feel extremely insecure. While pledges that Ukraine will never join NATO, Look, Ukraine, I mean, Ukraine is not on track to join NATO. Everybody agrees with this. Promises of never are very uncomfortable for any alliance to make. This is not because NATO wants to invite the Ukrainians in. It's because it's been very clear that any alliance enlargement is up to present members and prospective states and no one else. And then the third option we just keep talking to see if a solution can be found that meets everyone's needs, at least for the near term, to kick the ball down the road until the next crisis. So is neutrality for Ukraine part of that solution? Um, and sadly, I don't think it is, not because it's inherently a terrible idea, but because it's not, it's only workable after you've got a solution, not as a solution in the near term, right? You might get there eventually, you're not going to get there in order to solve this problem. Why? Well, been tried before and it hasn't stuck, right? You used to have a Ukrainian constitution that committed to non-bloc status. And as the, um, you know, as I think all of us know, we've had a lot of back and forth within Ukraine itself on what the, you know, just how aligned with NATO Ukraine would or would not be. And um, Heinz and Maya Yannick have a very nice paper that goes through some of this back and forth uh, in these documents. Also the foreign, promises of security uh, that come with neutrality were also tried in a fairly weak way with the Budapest Memorandum, right? They were security uh, assurances, not guarantees. And that was for a very good reason, which was nobody wanted to offer guarantees. Uh, but again, you know, once something has fallen apart, even something that's comparatively weak, it's really hard to convince people that you've got real guarantees in the works that they're going to believe in and that they're going to trust. Third, um, Ukraine has been invaded recently by the country that it's supposed to, uh, you know, be neutral next to. Um, it's a tough ask to tell somebody that, yeah, okay, now you should be, they just invaded you, but, you know, you don't, you shouldn't look for protection against them. You should just kind of find a nice middle path. Um, and, you know, that has, as I think I already said, erased some of the ambivalence that was very much a very big part of the Ukrainian polity when it came to the way that Ukrainians looked at the West and at Russia. Um, it has made Russia into much more of a threat. And you're seeing this with that opinion polling, which I do trust, and you're seeing it shift and become more, stronger and stronger each, each year. So Ukrainians know they're not going to get NATO membership, right? They're not dumb and they're not unable to read the tea leaves. Um, what they've settled for in this very difficult situation is a sort of aspirational alignment, right? Where they don't get any guarantees, but they do say, we want to be part of the West. This is where we want to be. And hey, if you guys could help us out as much as possible and see if you can frighten the Russians enough that they don't do us too much more damage, we'd appreciate that. Um, and it's not a comfortable position and it's not a secure position. Um, they feel safer with that though, than I think they would feel with Russian promises. Fourth reason that neutrality is problematic uh, in the near term is that Western states don't care that much about Ukraine, to be honest, but they also very much don't want to give up and back away. Um, and they, there's no way that they, Ukraine and Russia, wouldn't see any kind of real pressure on Ukraine to accept neutrality as anything other than capitulation. So, you know, the Russians may actually, if the Russians are right that a war would prove to everybody that they take this all more seriously than they do, then maybe that is how you could get to some kind of capitulation. But it's very hard to imagine that happening short of that. Um, and I think, you know, I think this is a real problem. Um, so over time, yes, neutrality may be a goal, but we're not there. Uh, what we need to do in the meantime is our best to find solutions that can be nested in a broader European security arrangements with all of those arms control limits, including, I would note, in the Baltic Sea, 
uh, where agreeing to disagree on Crimea, I think, would be a really important step forward. Commitments not to station forces on non-allied territory um, on the part of everybody. Toning down the rhetoric on enlargement without backing away from enlargement, which I just don't think is plausible in the near term. But then recognizing that it might not work. Um, and we may find ourselves all talking again after there has been um, more escalation. Uh, which is not a terribly cheering thought, but it's uh, all I've got. It's where I come down. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Olga. I think it was very complimentary also to what others have been saying. And um, uh, Luisa, what you heard uh, until now, I mean, you as a as a political geographer, and I mean, we have been talking in recent years again about the return of geopolitics, and now we have like this Sale made between, like again, the east and uh, the east and, and the west. How would you assess the role of Russia, but also the European Union? We haven't been talking a lot about the European Union so far, but we know that, for example, I mean, Ukraine is bordering. I mean, even the Western part used part of historical Hung Hungarian Austrian Empire, etc. So, from your point of view, what what would you like to add to the discussion? Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you also for organizing this talk and. Um, Yes, I guess from my political geographer perspective, I'd be very happy to say something about how the broader geopolitics of the Ukraine question is being staged, because I think it's a very important point that already has been raised. So who are the players that matter here? What is the script? And I would, in fact, like to uh, say something about the role played, or rather not played, by the EU, and I guess echoing in part what Olga just said about placing this question in a broader European security architecture. So I guess the, the first point that I would like to raise regards some very troubling assumptions of most analyses of what should be done, because already the specification of possible solutions determines who will be the players in the game. And what we have seen in the past months, in fact, is an um, entirely uncritical full-scale adoption of the language of classical geopolitics. So hard power, military might, territorial control, invoking in fact a new Cold War as uh, Ambassador Matlock uh, noted in his opening comments. And here I'm not speaking just about the language used by Russia. The fact that not only just US, but also European commentators, including reputable think tanks, have been repeating over the past weeks that Diplomacy is absolutely useless unless backed by hard power. Um, this is very troubling to my mind. So when uh, leading European think tanks publish commentaries noting that to counter a power willing to use military might, only military might will do. And by the way, um, uh, Turkey was cited, so I'll bring this up, um, cite Erdogan as a successful model of standing up to Putin, we have a problem. And it is a problem because it immediately sidelines any solution that is not military or at least based in security and defense structures. So the EU in this imaginary becomes immediately reduced to NATO and any alternative geopolitical solutions or security architectures are immediately precluded. And that's in fact what has been happening in the past months. Um, as you will all be aware, um, the EU's high representative was not present in Geneva, nor in Brussels, where the dialogue was taking place between Russia, the US and NATO. And I think um, it's very easy, as we usually do, to blame the EU for the state of affairs. So, you know, kind of invoking the usual commonplaces of you know, lack of a common European geopolitical vision, the unwillingness by Europe to take great power decisions, disunity among member states, um, and you know, uh, these accusations of Europe's supposed geopolitical weakness are not new. And they are in part correct. So the lack of a common position on Russia is and has long been a problem that has in fact been ably exploited uh, by Putin. I mean, you know, I'm just thinking most recently, you know, the, the incident of Lavrov approaching the German and French foreign ministers directly in the autumn, um, you know, to kind of restart discussions within the Normandy format, but, you know, we could cite numerous uh, other instances. The lack of consensus among EU member states on what to do with Nord Stream 2 is also indicative. And, you know, halting this project is certainly one very real non-military weapon that the Union could use. And 
Um, it's interesting because Josep Borre in the past few days had become saying quite explicitly that this is something that should be considered, in fact, contradicting other EU leaders, including German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. But I want to return um, to how the discussions, and I don't mean just the actual discussions that have been taking place between Russia, the US and NATO, but also the kind of the wider discussions taking place in the media and the policy community. So how these discussions have already, in a sense, framed in seemingly inevitable fashion, both the realm of possibility of what can be done and the option of neutrality that we are discussing simply doesn't enter into it. And you know, in this sense, I, I would um, agree with Olga. I mean, there, but there are other things that are precluded as well. Um, and you know, Nikolai was mentioning, you know, kind of the anathema of talking about a federal solution. I mean, that is also completely absent. So it's not only the options, the realm of possibility that has been defined in these discussions, but also the players who matter. So who has the right to speak? and make these decisions. Um, when Borel traveled to Eastern Ukraine last week, he pronounced, you know, kind of grandly that we are no longer in Yalta times and, you know, we cannot think that great powers will be deciding the fate of others. And the comment that he made um, was that, quote, any discussion regarding European security must also include the European Union and Ukraine. Now, unfortunately, his words were, you know, were lovely words, but have so far fallen into a vacuum. Because not only um, neither the EU nor um, mostly Ukraine have been present at the talks, but what is more, in these discussions, both the EU and Ukraine have been reduced to singular um, geopolitical caricatures of themselves. Um, the EU has been reduced to NATO, and so when we have Jens Stoltenberg saying of the exclusion of the EU in Brussels, that it's not a problem because, as he said, European allies are at the table because European allies are in NATO. I mean, saying this, we have a direct depotentiation of the role of the EU, of the role of the high representative, stripped of any right to speak for Europe. But we also preclude any solution that does not pass through NATO, enlarged NATO or not. Ukraine, on the other hand, is reduced to what those who claim to be speaking for Ukraine say it is. And I don't mean here Ukrainian politicians, but Russian, American or European politicians speaking for Ukraine. Um, and here, so what Ukraine supposedly is in terms of its security desiderata, its relationship to Europe, to Russia, but also um, any kind of imaginaries of its internal politics. You know, kind of again echoing what uh, what Nikolai said, and as much as it has become very fashionable to repeat that Ukraine must be sovereign in deciding its own fate, I think every European politician has said, you know, said this. Um, Ukrainian voices or a diversity of Ukrainian voices have been mostly absent from these international discussions about the country's fate. And what has been largely absent um, is the recognition confirmed by numerous studies by now, including by colleagues present here with us today. Um, and um, I see Derek Tall, who's done work on this with another colleague, um, John O'Loughlin, um, that there is no singular desire in Ukraine for the solutions proposed by either side. Um, and you know, here again, I will be echoing what, what Nikolai said. Um, and I think this is very important to keep in mind when we're looking at this, you know, kind of broader set of geopolitical representations and, you know, again, who are the actors in the game and what they want. Um, and I wanted to cite here a piece that many of you will have probably seen published a couple of weeks ago by um, Ukrainian political scientist Vladyshchenko, who noted that not only Ukraine is playing a secondary role in these discussions and in these negotiations about its destiny. But as he said, in a typically colonial way, commentators are homogenizing Ukrainians and misrecognizing the political diversity of a nation of over 40 million people. So the problem is not just deciding without Ukraine, appeals you know, to Ukraine's sovereign right to decide aside, but also deciding for a very um, diverse Ukraine as if they held identical opinions. Um, now, you know, kind of thinking back to Many studies, and you know, and Olga, you were noting this as well. That yes, you know, there are um, quite a few uh, uh, field studies and opinion polls. Um, you know, in December two thousand and seven, so on the eve of the famous Bucharest summit, um, 
you know, less than 20% of Ukrainian citizens supported joining NATO. Um, as a result of the annexation of Crimea, the start of the war in Donbas, that figure has gone up to about 40%. But that 40% has not only, you know, kind of gotten to 40% because, you know, some previously skeptical Ukrainians started to see NATO as somehow a protection against further um, hostile actions from Russia, and this is the point that Ishchenko makes. But what is important in looking at that 40% is that those surveys um, do not, most of them, include um, the most pro-Russian Ukrainian citizens from the territories that are no longer under Ukrainian government control. And, and again, you know, aside from what you're saying, Olga, that it is possible, um, you know, to do surveys in those territories. The main point here is that, you know, when we are speaking for Ukraine, the voices of many Ukrainians are simply not accounted for. Now, it's very likely that um, Russia's actions have raised that percentage today. But what I would want to close with is that focusing the entire issue on the question of NATO membership is mistaken, because asking that question reduces the very realm of geopolitical possibility to a black and white choice between NATO and Russia with no other options possible just as it reduces who we claim to be speaking for. And um, I will end my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. I think you also added some, some very interesting points and we see like how complex the whole situation is. And I think it is also very important, Olga addressed it as well. We are talking about a peaceful solution today uh, for Ukraine without actually speaking with Ukrainians even still here. Uh, let me just know we have been discussing this before and we are also planning uh, to work together with Ukrainians on this issue as well. Before I uh, go uh, next to, to, to Heinz, uh, Nikolai just very briefly asked me, he wants to clarify a question for Olga very briefly just before we then go on then I guess uh, more into the topic of neutrality. Please Nikolai, very shortly. Yes, thank you. I, I like the back, I like more of a back and forth so that we can understand what it is we're actually agreeing about and the things that we do disagree about. So I chose the term Russophile rather than Russophone advisedly. And I'd like to ask Olga specifically how many, what percentage of the population in Ukraine today she considers Russophile? Thank you. Okay, so I don't have statistical data on this in front of me. Um, I think there are folks on this call who might be able to answer this better than I and with data at their disposal. My understanding from looking at this material in the course of my own work is that generally speaking, affinity towards Russia and fondness for Russia as an ally, as a friendly power, et cetera, has, you know, used to be kind of at a 50-50 mark and it's been declining for understandable reasons. Yes, in government controlled Ukraine where you're doing the polling um, over the course of the last eight years. I will also say from my own interactions with people, including people who are non-government controlled Ukraine, that is also true, A, and even in non-government controlled Ukraine, um, there is a growing frustration with Russia. Uh, so, you know, when, when you say Russophilic, um, you know, you have to also define what it is you mean, right? And I don't want to derail this on this, but Russophilic doesn't mean you are really, really fond of the works of Lyudmila Petrushevskaya and Russian film. Does it mean that you want to join the Collective Security Treaty Organization? Does it mean you want to be part of the Eurasian Economic Union? So, you know, I'm not sure that um, I took Russophilic to me in your presentation as people who wanted alignment, um, whether it's military or economic or social, sociocultural with Russia, but perhaps you meant something else, but then, you know. Thank you very much, uh, Olga, for social your presentation. Yeah. Um, okay, now let's move to our last speaker. I mean, we still have some time and we might prolong some extra minutes because it's so many speakers. But Heinz, after what you have been hearing so far, I mean, neutrality has been mentioned and I'm pretty sure that this is uh, um, also the topic you would like to speak about. But um, as you know, it's it's very contested when it comes to Ukraine. And I would also already like to bring in a question from Thomas Ainozzi, where he actually states that neutral states tend to be small and espouse neutrality on their free will. And if these preconditions, uh, are they not making it unlikely that Ukraine will decide to become neutral? So maybe you can already reflect on your remarks on, on the question from Thomas. And please, um, um, what is your solution for a, peace, a peaceful solution for Ukraine? 
Thank you, Stephanie. And uh, I want to thank uh, Pascal Lotta. So he was the father of this webinar. He had this idea, but also I want to thank the IAP, of course, to give uh, the uh, organizational uh, support. Um, I will address the question by Thomas a little bit uh, later. Uh, ever since the Georgian uh, crisis in 2008, uh, I was considering whether neutrality would be an uh, option for the East Central European states, and especially after the Ukraine crisis in uh, 2014. So, and I'm looking at the Austrian model, uh, whether it could be applied to the so-called in-between states. Uh, the in-between states, this is a term used by the OEC report of 2015, back to uh, diplomacy, uh, the issuing a report. And um, I have to say they didn't invent uh, the term in between, somebody else did, but I uh, will come back to it later. In order to make this analogy, Austria and the in-between states comparable, uh, I will use the context uh, of polarization. And uh, polarization, of course, comes uh, in different shapes and forms in different periods. And the Cold War and the bipolarity uh, was mentioned. We had these two uh, Cold War alliances, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. But uh, the neutral states at then, that time were the exception. They were the anomaly uh, of the block system. So they stayed out of the uh, block system uh, uh, already. Nevertheless, I have to say they played a very useful role in mediating uh, between uh, the big powers and uh, the alliances, especially uh, when you look, we look at the CSE uh, process. Uh, after uh, the bipolarity, we have this academic concept uh, mapped out by Charles Krauthammer about this unipolar moment. And the unipol in the unipolar moment, NATO endured, NATO stayed on, uh, Warsaw Pact Treaty uh, disappeared. There's a lot of discussion why NATO did not demise and the Warsaw Pact did, uh, did. So that's not the uh, topic of today. Uh, but I also have to say this unipolar moment was not very uh, peaceful uh, at all. And then uh, realists came out with this multipolarity. And uh, looking at history, we know multipolarity was not a very peaceful uh, concept as well. 1914 uh, already uh, was mentioned. Uh, other versions of this multipolarity, so the post-American world or the rest, the rise of uh, the rest. So, but polarization and polarity always comes with two features. Uh, one feature is uh, the ideological idealist uh, underpinning. So we know, know it from the Cold War, we had this democracies and market economies against communist and plant uh, economies, but also now, you have this idea, at least in the academic uh, world, about this uh, democratic hegemony. So and it comes also in different versions. Uh, Robert Kagan says, OK, democratic uh, uh, hegemony can only be achieved by uh, the American leadership. And then you have John Erkenberry who is saying, no, 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 uh, uh, the democratic hegemony, hegemony is uh, already uh, possible and then can prevail if there is a possible American uh, decline. Uh, the second feature is alliance building. In polarization, there is, is uh, accompanied always with alliances and al new alliances, existing alliances. Uh, and a case in point for the combination between these two features, the uh, idealist and the alliance feature is uh, Joseph Biden's uh, alliance of uh, democracies. Here you have both, but I have to say uh, it has an uh, hypocritical aspect because uh, if necessary, the US always allies uh, with uh, authoritarian uh, states uh, as well. Um, so uh, geopolitics uh, always trumps idealism. Uh, we have now this existing alliances. We have NATO, as I mentioned, but we also have the CSTO, it has been mentioned by Olga already as well. Uh, it has become recently prominent because of the Kazakhstan uh, case, the uh, Collective Security uh, uh, Treaty. But we have new alliances emerging. 
we have this AUKUS and uh, the Quad uh, in Asia, we have the Abrahama Quads in, uh, in uh, the Middle East. So we have seen in a, behind a situation, situation of polarization and alliance building, but where does it leave small states? Where does it leave small states? What do small states do in this uh, conflagration of uh, polarization? Small states only have two choices. They have two choices. One choice is bandwagon with a big power and join an alliance. The second choice is neutrality. The second choice is neutrality, staying out of great power conflict, avoiding of being entrapped in a uh, big uh, power uh, conflict. So uh, when uh, this uh, polarization uh, is um, applied uh, to the situation in the 50s, not, I have to say, uh, also uh, realists at a, a third uh, option, uh, they say uh, bandwagoning and neutrality and one other option would be balancing. But balancing is not really an option for small states because, because they don't make much of a difference. And uh, if you talk about balancing, it's uh, many ways a euphemism uh, of um, of bandwagoning. So uh, small states, uh, what options do they have, have? Uh, in the 50s, uh, looking into the Austrian uh, example, uh, neutrality, Austria was already entrapped uh, in a big power conflict. So the solution for, for Austria uh, was uh, the option of uh, neutrality. So Austria was occupied by big powers, it was divided, and when it opted for neutrality, uh, it got its territorial integrity and sovereignty back. Uh, the troops of the foreign uh, powers, including the Soviet Union, uh, would leave. Accompanied to this uh, neutrality, uh, the neutrality law, and I have to say, uh, it's uh, based on international law, and uh, that's what is the difference, what Olga mentions, what is different to the Budapest Memorandum and the uh, self-declared neutrality of uh, uh, Ukraine before uh, uh, 2014. So it's, it was not based on international law. So as Austrian neutrality was much, uh, much uh, st stronger. So, and uh, accompanied with this neutrality law, uh, was a state treaty in where Austria was prohibited to join uh, Germany. It means to join a big neighbor. So using the analogy, for example, for Ukraine, uh, the big neighbor could, uh, Germany could easily be exchanged uh, with, uh, uh, with Russia. Um, we, we call it this Anschluss uh, for both. Germany went a different path, as we know. Uh, so it, uh, was divided, divided, remained uh, divided. However, when Austria became neutral, uh, Austria was a model for German unification again in the in the 50s. Uh, so several thinkers and pundits uh, used Austria uh, as a suggestion for Germany, but not only for, Jay, for Germany. The most prominent one was uh, George Cannon. George Cannon suggested the central, a neutral central European uh, song. Uh, George Cannon, you, he was the one who coined the term in between states. Actually, he, sta he, he said states are in between. So it was not the OEC who really invented it. Uh, but uh, George Cannon was joined by other prominent figures. The leader, leader of the British Labour Party, Hugh Scatescale, had a similar suggestion. There was an American bipartisan uh, initiative by the senators Humphrey and Nolan who had a similar suggestion of this neutral Central European song. And the most uh, well-known is the Rapatsky plan of 57, when the Polish foreign minister suggested or linked this disengagement neutral song with a nuclear weapon-free song. It didn't work out, you know. Uh, one reason was Konrad Adenauer. Konrad Adenauer fiercely uh, opposed neutrality of Germany. So he said that was an put to sleep the tactic and the poison by the Soviet Union, which was not true. If you look at Finland and uh, Austria, they didn't end up in the Soviet bloc. So it was not really a Soviet uh, uh, strategy. Um, 
so it, 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 it basically Germany uh, remained uh, divided. So if we apply this now, this polarization uh, uh, to the in-between states, what we have now, so we have this in-between states uh, with, between Russia and uh, NATO, uh, and on some of them we have uh, Russian troops deployed, but also uh, Russian supported militias like in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. So looking at this uh, analogy of Austria and Germany, basically they have only two choices. They have two choices. They can join an alliance and bandwagon uh, with a big state, mean uh, becoming NATO uh, member, uh, but that implies that they remain uh, divided because the Russians might stay, Russian militias, even the Russians might send in official troops as well to uh, Donbass. So bandwagon and alliance membership would be one choice. And the second choice is neutrality. So neutrality would the possibility for Ukraine to get its uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty back as Austria did in uh, 55. Um, so they have the choice between the German pass and the Austrian pass. They have the choice between permanent division or permanent uh, neutrality. Uh, now the question of, of Thomas, of course, uh, Austrian neutrality uh, uh, was adopted by the Austrian parliament. Uh, it was a domestic decision, but of course the, in Ukraine there has to be a domestic, it has been linked to a domestic decision uh, as well. Uh, if, you, if they want to be neutral and get its territorial uh, integrity back, so that would be up to the uh, Ukraine uh, government. But I have to say, uh, it took 10 years uh, for Austria to come to this decision as well uh, for neutrality, because in 54, uh, uh, 55, before the Austrian parliament adopted the, uh, uh, the permanent uh, neutrality, uh, uh, basically, no one in Austria supported neutrality anymore, no party anymore. It was only the conservative Chancellor Raab who went to Moscow and negotiated with the right uh, Soviet uh, faction uh, to negotiate neutrality. It could have turned out very differently, and uh, Austria would uh, have been uh, remained occupied and uh, divided as Germany was. Thank you very uh, much, Hans, for also lightening, enlightening us a little bit also on this neutrality concept, like based on international law and how difficult it is also then to, to include and to convince uh, the people. I would say we still have around 15 up to 20 minutes left uh, for discussion because it took us a little bit longer as I was expecting with us, such a huge panel. But maybe Pascal, you just hop in and, and post the first question. I think there is one for Ambassador Metlock, which came in already a while ago, and then I'll see and just uh, jump in as well. Uh, yes, so thank you very much for everybody uh, giving us your insights. We have a lot of things happening already in the chat. And maybe let me ask this question that came in at the beginning um, to Ambassador Matlock and, and Dr. Liefen. It's a, it's a bit of a long question, but I will read it out loud. Leading strategic expert of the Russian International Affairs Council, Andrei uh, Korunov, in a recent interview, with Executive Intelligence Review, where he soberly viewed the conflicts in the world, stated that he believed that Afghanistan was one of the few areas in the world where he sees no major contradictions between East and West, and where there is an opportunity for multilateral cooperation. Um, relevant portions of the interview with Mr. Uh, Kortunov are below among the link uh, to the full interview. Do you agree? that this is possible and desirable and that cooperative action to stop the unfolding unprecedented humanitarian disaster in Afghanistan could have a positive spillover effect into red line situations such as Ukraine and Taiwan and begin to shift the failed underlying assumption identified by Ambassador Matlock. Well, I think any effort to cooperate to create uh, fulfill, you might say, the interests of both countries is useful. And uh, that's precisely 
how we engineered our way out of the Cold War to begin with. Because what we did was to try to quietly find areas where our interests were in common and we could cooperate. And within about three years from the high tension that was there in 1983 and 84, by 1988 and 89, we were already ending the Cold War uh, because we were cooperating in more and more areas instead of uh, sort of competing in areas where neither could win. So yes, that, and I think also if there is a commitment to uh, do more to um, uh, to combat cybercrime, uh, which is going to be a big issue, uh, that could be very important. There are other very clear common issues uh, which uh, we can uh, uh, we can deal with, and in fact, the Biden administration has said uh, we want to continue negotiations about strategic stability and the other things. So there are a lot of things out there uh, that can do this. But I would like to also make one point uh, about Ukraine uh, specifically. We have seen in this debate how so many issues uh, uh, really generate a lot of emotion. Uh, now, I think that one of them is that somehow the decision over NATO membership or the possibility of having it can contribute to, you might say, the democratization and the economic uh, improvement of Ukraine. That is a misconception because what will, what will in effect make the matter even worse is continuing to militarize these issues. I'll take the time to simply remind people, I was the American ambassador in Moscow when the three Baltic countries began to develop their desire for independence. They would come to me for consultations beginning in 1989, beginning with the Lithuanians, the Latvians, the Estonians, and they would describe their, uh, their aspirations. And then they would say, Inasmuch as you do not recognize legally our incorporation in the Soviet Union, when we declare independence, of course you will recognize us. And I said, no. And there was a shock. They said, what do you mean? I said, no, for two reasons. One, the formal reason, we recognize uh, countries uh, that declare their independence if they, in fact, control the territory that uh, they claim. You don't control that territory yet. But I said the real reason is if we were to recognize your declaration of independence, that would bring about a Soviet repression. And it's something we can do nothing to protect you. Keep it peaceful keep it within the month, because if this goes violent for any reason, we cannot help you. Now, this is the situation also in Ukraine. And the idea somehow, if they were in NATO, that would help them solve their problems with Russia is absurd. It would exacerbate those problems. There are now several people have asked, do you really think Russian uh, invasion is possible? It is hard for me to believe that a, pres uh, a person as smart as President uh, Putin is would actually invade Ukraine uh, in force uh, because this would create so many problems for them, uh, almost least of all the sanctions uh, uh, from the United States, which I think is not achieving anything in this uh, uh, respect. But if they were to, of course, they would win. There's like no question about that. And they would, you know, they would have maybe some guerrilla warfare here and there. I think they could be in key. I'm not a military expert. I think they could be occupying Kiev in less than a week. So, I mean, 
Let's be realistic. And now others have said, oh, well, if they're in NATO, they will have uh, Article 5 guarantees. Does Article 5 guarantee that the United States would come to the military assistance of one invaded? No. Read the treaty. It says that if one is attacked, if a member is attacked, it will be considered an attack on all, and that the governments, and here I'm paraphrasing, uh, will consider how to respond. It is not an automatic, we're going to fight. Have that in mind. And people who think that somehow that's going to be a solution to the problems that Georgia or Ukraine has are simply being deluded. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Anatoly, even the question also went to you. Mm. Uh, I must say, I'm uh, so sorry. I, I have to leave in about five minutes um, because I hadn't realized it would go on so long. Um, yes, uh, I, I mean, look to, well, two things. First, um, uh, I, I, say I, I can't do this because I have to go, but uh, it would be very good to have a deeper discussion of the issue uh, of um, the peace settlement for the Donbass, uh, based on the Minsk II agreement, which after all uh, was drawn up by the French and Germans and endorsed by the United States uh, and uh, the United Nations. But uh, we have really done nothing since then actually to bring about its implementation. Now, of course, there are big problems on the Russian side as well. Uh, but, um, you know, one must say clearly that the, uh, the Ukrainian side uh, has failed to, to issue the, the, the guarantees for Donbass autonomy, which are laid down, which obviously uh, are the central and inescapable uh, basis for any peace settlement there. Um, so, uh, and yeah, I mean, what is wrong with federalism, you know, democratic federalism? Germany has it, America has it, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, is is this a, a one way out of the the present um, impasse? Um, but the other point I think we 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 do need to come back to is um, I, I do think that we all of us need to concentrate very heavily uh, on the avoidance of war. Um, now, obviously, that uh, involves pressure on Russia certainly the threat of, of sanctions. But we do need to, to depart from you know, a variety of facts uh, that uh, war would be disastrous. It would be disastrous in the first instance, of course, for Ukraine itself and the people, you know, the ordinary people who would be in the, in the way of that war. But obviously it would have much wider uh, international um, repercussions. Uh, but also, I mean, to sum up the present Western position very unsympathetically, uh, we are too physically cowardly to fight for Ukraine. And we are too morally cowardly uh, to make the sacrifices of prestige and our empty formal positions necessary uh, to reach a peace settlement over Ukraine. Now, you can talk as much as you like about our great, um, you know, democratic principles and so forth. Uh, I do not think that that is a morally admirable position. Thank you. Maybe if I have been with another question and uh, yeah, um, Anatoly, if you need to leave, I mean, I would say thank you very much from our side for, for joining us today. And uh, I hope we'll see you as each other in the future. But since you also mentioned it, uh, I would like just uh, to stick to the topic um, about what is happening in the in the Donbass region. And there was a question in the chat uh, about the Minsk agreements and Fred Tanner, uh, nice to see you Fred, uh, also is asking, um, the Minsk agreements, uh, they actually provide a separatist uh, republic uh, in the Donbass with a special status for the so-called non-governmental controlled areas. So his question is, on what grounds would this special status reflect uh, a federal solution uh, as opposed to decentralization? And from where would the separatist republics draw the authority for a grand regard or even a veto power on Kiev uh, foreign policy issues? Who would like to address that? There would be no formal uh, veto 
um, on uh, Ukrainian foreign policy. But obviously, the reincorporation of a major Russian speaking area, uh, which certainly in the past uh, has been extremely hostile to uh, NATO membership, um, would act as a considerable de facto block on that. Uh, but um, the, uh, the the issue of um, autonomy for the Donbass, uh, once again, I mean, look, uh, opinion polls are, I, I have to repeat, I, I think, unreliable. Uh, but uh, certainly until 2014, um, opinion polls showed very strong support within the Donbass uh, for autonomous status within Ukraine, as, by the way, they did in Crimea as well. Uh, and But I think most importantly, um, you know, agreements on local autonomy as a solution to ethnic conflicts um, are very much, um, you know, have been part of the West's playbook, sometimes successful, sometimes unsuccessful, but certainly a standard part uh, of our approach uh, to seeking peace settlements in the case of such conflicts. And I don't see why... Uh, <sighs> in terms of principle, at least, uh, there is any objection uh, to this solution for the, the Donbass uh, conflict, uh, especially uh, given that the only, and I mean the only alternative uh, solution is Russian military victory. Um, the Ukrainians are not going to reconquer it, that's for sure. Um, so it's basically a, a, set, you know, a compromise on autonomy, an unending conflict, hopefully semi-frozen, but semi-frozen conflicts have a way of becoming unfrozen, as we've seen again and again in Kashmir, for example, um, uh, you know, or war and military victory for Russia, which I hope none of us want. Uh, the other thing about, um, you know, our, our right, if you like, to speak over the heads of the of the Ukrainians, um, well, we have been asked to admit Ukraine, you know, into um, our alliances. That automatically gives us a say uh, in the um, in the outcome. And of course, in um, in so many conflicts around the world, I mean, that's why you have mediation efforts. That that's why you sometimes have very forceful mediation efforts uh, by the outside world, precisely because. Uh, the local parties are unable to come to an agreement without it. So, um, you know, there's no good saying that we don't have a role. We do have a role. I'm so sorry, I, I do have to run. But thank you all so much for a most interesting discussion. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Um, Olga also wanted to respond to the, to the Minsk 2 question, please. Yeah, very quickly, because I think it's a really good question, uh, because the actual Minsk II language talks about special status. It's not that specific. So why does everyone keep talking about this meaning of veto over foreign policy? And the answer to that question is because a lot of Russian officials have made that very clear, that that's what they want, and that that's kind of the vision. I would also say that I think that Ukrainians, in shying away from implementing Minsk II, underestimate themselves a little bit. Uh, the notion that, as Anatol suggested, that it's simply reincorporating these territories give you automatically, um, you know, force you to take in a huge uh, voting block that is going to be against everything that Kiev is for, well, depends on how you treat them, right? It depends on what happens next. It depends on the relationship that is built. And I'm also of the belief that Ukraine is a very large, diverse country that would be well served by federalization. I do believe federalization type alternatives as a way to implement Minsk have been proposed and suggested by the Ukrainian government that kind of we do this throughout the country. And they've gotten a lot of pushback uh, from on that from Russia. So, you know, it's not as easy as just, oh, we should. I mean, I agree, that's a great plan for Ukraine for all sorts of reasons, Minsk, no Minsk, war, no war, but it's not as simple as that. But in terms of the special status, I do think the Ukrainians underestimate what they could do if they actually work to think about how to reintegrate this territory. And, you know, what that would mean, uh, that it's not about taking a poison pill. These are your people. And if, you, if you've been fighting a war for eight years for this territory, consider that maybe you actually, if you want it, that means you have to reintegrate it. And, um, you know, I, I do think that that's, uh, I mean, that's something I've been talking to Ukrainians about for the entire eight years. Um, and, you know, I, 
whatever happens next, right? If they aren't forced to give it up entirely, I think that's something they have to be thinking about. I think Nikolai also wants to say something about this. Yes, thank you very briefly. Um, uh, federalism and what the Ukrainian government, federalism is rejected as a concept, as an idea by the Ukrainian government, but they talk instead of a deep decentralization, which you can interpret in a lot of different ways. And they actually encourage a discussion of what that would mean. Um, what it does not constitute a veto. In any case, uh, whatever decentralization becomes, and if it were to resemble something along the lines of federalization, that's the end of the process. The process must begin with a discussion of uh, the idea of, of, of devolution, devolution of powers. Very difficult to swallow for Western Ukrainians, very difficult. Very difficult to swallow also for people in, in uh, I should say, uh, key actors, key political actors in Kiev, because it is so much more convenient for them to run the country by appointing all its governors, by, by appointing everybody, by collecting all the taxes, but you know, it's a centralized system. Uh, why would they give that power up when the whole reason for grabbing that power for exercising that power is to transform the country they're on a mission i think and you have to understand uh that mission now the veto comes in not in any formal sense but it is there it is lurking there clearly because look at the numbers right now the de facto exclusion of such a large number of, of people uh, in eastern Ukraine from the ability to vote in elections uh, has resulted in a guarantee of the current balance having shifted to pro-Maidan forces. We're talking about no elections for either side of the Donbass, not the uh, part-controlled uh, not, not under Kiev's control, and the part that is uh, controlled by the by the Kiev government, which is currently under martial law. Uh, no votes, no ability to vote if you are a Ukrainian citizen in Crimea or anywhere in Russia, the largest diaspora. All total, this amounts to close to 20% of the available pop voting population. And I can very well understand, as any political scientist can, why uh, Kiev would not be interested in having these people vote again, because their votes will go overwhelmingly against the current policy. So that is the veto lurking, that if these people then join the political discourse, we know how they'll vote, and that will result in uh, rebalancing that will effectively preclude NATO uh, membership for Ukraine. Thank you. And it is it is really sad because the discussion is wonderful, but we already have to start wrapping up. And I would like to give each one of you again the chance to um, reply to what you've heard or say what's on your mind in reverse order. So Heinz, Luisa, Olga, Nikolai, and then uh, Ambassador Matlock in the end, uh, Heinz. Um, are you okay? No, thank you. I spoke enough. I, I made my point. <laughs> thank you very much. In that case, uh, Louisa, would you like to? I'll just be extremely brief because I, you know, I, I found the discussion absolutely fascinating and I have learned a lot. And I think, you know, to my mind, I would just, you know, emphasize the need to be very careful about how we specify you know, who is speaking here. And, you know, the, the reason I keep stressing the absence of the EU and reducing the EU to NATO, I find it very problematic. Um, because again, it not only reduces who has the right to speak, as it does in this, you know, in the case of Ukraine, as we've been saying, um, but it also, you know, immediately reduces the solutions to solely military 
um, or defense ones. And there has been a lack of diplomacy. I mean, one of, you know, as uh, Annalena Baerbock ha- heads to Moscow, I mean, one of the points that she made is that for two years, there have been no discussions. So, you know, it's not a failure of diplomacy. There have not been <laughs> discussions. There hasn't been, you know, kind of sufficient dialogue. And we need to remember that. So I will just leave it at that. Thank you. Olga? Okay, very quickly. Um, and actually, first to respond to Louise a little bit, I mean, I, I do find kind of the, the EU role in this and the negation of it is interesting, right? Because it was EU association that started all of this. And it is the EU that delivers the sanctions, right? Which are a big chunk of the threat. Now, I agree with, I think everybody, or almost everybody on this panel in that, you know, the sanctions don't get you what you want, right? It's not that they're necessarily effective in the way that you want them to be effective, but they are the stick that Western states reach for. And it's the EU sanctions that are most important here. Um, NATO membership, I do want to also stress Ukrainians can all vote unanimously for NATO membership. They still don't get it until the NATO member states unanimously want to give Ukraine membership. And they don't want to have a war with Russia. Now, if they already find themselves in a war with Russia, if they get, you know, if it happens by other means, if another one of these escalations gets them there, it becomes the same thing. But, you know, this is... This is like the Budapest Memorandum and why those were security assurances and not guarantees. It's not because, oh gosh, nobody thought this could happen. It's because everybody knew perfectly well this could happen and they didn't want, um, they didn't want to have the war. And then would Russia win the war? Does it have enough forces? I mean, I agree with Ambassador Matlock. Uh, yes, they would win the war. Yes, they have enough forces. I would also add, there's a variety of things they could do. They are masked to do a lot but it is all scalable. They don't have to do it all at once. Thank you very much. Um, may I just say very quickly that we have an, uh, one participant also from uh, uh, from Odessa, I think, and she keeps pointing and stress uh, pointing out in the chat room that uh, Donbas population do not make up thirty percent of Ukrainian voters, and um, at the best, according to even to. 2013 numbers, it would be 13.5. And she also made the point in another uh, place that not um, everybody, um, all the Russian speakers of these territories are all to automatically uh, Rus Russoph Russophiles. I just want to point this out because it's true. We also don't have a uh, Ukrainian participant here. So uh, for anyone listening, we will catch up on this also with Ukrainian colleagues in the very near future. Um, Nikolai, do you um, want to add something to the, to the discussion? I think you're muted. Nikolai, you're still muted. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, we don't have a formal Ukrainian participant, although I do spend a good part of every year in my residence in Ukraine but it's only part of the year. Um, and we don't have any participants from Russia either, curiously. <laughs> Be nice to have the two of them at the same table, don't you think? Uh, but my, I just wanna reiterate my, uh, my main point, which is uh, the conflict over Ukraine is distinct from the conflict within Ukraine. Both are important, but they are separate. Resolving the conflict over Ukraine will not automatically resolve the conflict within Ukraine, whereas I think resolving the conflict within Ukraine will restore agency to Ukrainians and effectively resolve the conflict over Ukraine. That's my only point. Thank you. Thank you very much. In that case, um, let me wrap up by saying that um, studying European history we realize that in regular intervals, uh, we Europeans, all of us, do stupid things, unfortunately. And I hope this is not one of those moments. I do hope that we can this time avoid um, the spiral. Um, and I thank you all for participating and sharing your thoughts on how to get out um, of, the, um, of the spiral, or at least not further down to it. And from the part of neutrality studies, um, thank you for, for your participation. And Stephanie, please. Thank you very much.
much, Pascal. Thanks to all participants. I think it was very interesting. I mean, we talked about historical backgrounds, about sovereignty, about identity question within Ukraine, the role of Russia and the US. So it's it's just a very broad picture. And I, I, and I think we can agree upon that we cannot tackle all the issues involved, even though we would like to. So uh, we will keep on working, especially on the topic also in regard uh, of Ukraine. And let's hope that it's going not to be an escalation, a violent escalation. This is a personal hope, uh, working for an institute which is dealing with peace. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, have a nice um, evening, morning, night to you, Pascal. And uh, it was a pleasure. And um, we keep you updated. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.